Hello, everyone, and welcome to <laughs> World Bank Group Data Privacy Day 2022. This is our third annual celebration of International Data Privacy or Data Protection Day, um, a day that is meant to raise awareness of uh, data privacy, data protection issues, and opportunities. So we are very happy that you've joined us this morning. Um, joined us today, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we have a full day of uh, events discussing and, um, and learning more about data privacy and data protection. Our first panel this morning is an excellent, excellent panel, a roundtable with global data protection authorities. We are going to hear about two different um, approaches um, and one common thread that Brazil and Spain have forged. So our panelists today are Mercedes Ortuño Sierra. She is the head of ATD and help desk unit of the Spanish Data Protection Authority. And we have Miriam Wimmer, director at the Brazilian Data Protection Authority. Our opening remarks are brought to us thanks to Commissioner Blanca uh, Ibarra, the President, Commission, President Commissioner of Mexico's National Institute for Transparency, Access to Information, and Personal Data Protection. And Commissioner um, Ibarra also became the, the new Chair of the Global Privacy Assembly. Um, Elizabeth Denham was previously the Chair of the Global Privacy Assembly. She stepped down. You may re recall that Elizabeth spoke with us last year at Data Privacy Day. And our closing remarks are brought to us by Boyana Bellamy, the president of the Center for Information Policy. Um, Boyana is also a, um, a return guest with us. So we will first hear opening remarks from our panelists, and then we will turn to a roundtable discussion, followed by questions from you, the audience. So please post those in the chat function. So, uh, Commissioner Ibarra, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. As such, January 28th, we are celebrating the International Data Protection Day, of course, in commemoration of the anniversary of Convention 108 of the European Council and to raise awareness about the relevance of this right in the global context. As President Commissioner of the National Institute for Transparency, Access to Information and Personal Data Protection of Mexico, and as a Chair of the Global Privacy Assembly, I would like to greet and thank you everyone for your attendance in this event. I am certain that our work will have an impact and economic and technological developments, as well in strengthening the rule of law, the respect of human dignity, and the fulfill the goal of democratic systems, the welfare of societies. The pandemic of COVID-19 brings us transformation beyond the healthcare field, such as the acceleration of developments from the digital revolution and this phenomenon has highlighted the importance of effective personal data protection regulations. As a consequence, technological tools have been developed with the provision of sensitive personal data, and with this, the rise of questions about possible instructions into our privacy. In response of that, new regulations we require to get a balance between the reaction of governments facing the pandemic and protection of human rights. We needed a guarantee system that would allow us to collect confidential information in order to study, analyze, investigate, and monitor the pandemic we're facing. Our authorities have not stopped working and we have demonstrated our ability to face the challenges arising from the new paradigm of the digital age and big data. We are a global voice in benefit of the privacy of our societies. We share best practices to respond to new challenges and we support 
each other advising our actions. Let us continue to strengthen our work cohesively under a broad and united from which fulfills our purpose of acting and as only of the people by answering to their demands and needs, especially in emergency situations such as the current one. The GPA reiterates its commitment to support and provide close and permanent accompaniment to all those actors who help us to promote the adoption of measures for the protections of rights. I'm sure that with our cooperation and coordination, we will share experiences no. and good practices which will lead us to get our goal the full protection of personal data. Congratulations and thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Commissioner Ibarra, for those inspiring words. Um, we really appreciate you uh, sharing that with us and for opening this session and opening the entire Data Privacy Day for us. So thank you very much. Um, you are an inspiration. Um, we'll now turn to um, we'll now turn to uh, opening remarks from our speakers. Um, we will first start with uh, Ms. Artunio, and I will uh, give the stage to you. Mercedes, over to you. I'm afraid I don't know if you can hear me. Can you yes, hear I me? Yes, I can. Because yes. I, the problem is I cannot hear you. So I'm going to to speak up a little bit. Uh, I, I think your technicians are trying to to solve the situation, but in in any case, I'm going to to try to to start with uh, a little bit of presentation. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and invite the Data Protection Authority of Spain to participate in this interesting event. Uh, I'm very happy to to explain what we are doing as National Data Protection and also as a member of the European Union, because I think it's interesting for you to have a, a view of what is now cooking in the, in the European Union. These past years, uh, 20 and 21, has been super tough for, for all of us. This year is still being tough uh, because of that pandemic situation. And uh, first, the science gave the first hint, the first clue to how to overcome and, and to get out from from this situation, but also I want to say that the data protection authorities provided a very uh, important help to the authorities, the government, the science and the sanitaries that were working on that. We worked together, all the data protection agencies at the request of the, the Commission, in uh, providing the grounds to develop uh, centers of information and, and, and the European uh, Green uh, passport uh, related to vaccination in a manner that was compatible or uh, compliant with our values, our fundamental rights. I mean, we have been always trying to support, and I think that data protection authorities are there for help and to, to help uh, technologies and solve the big problems of the, of the world in, in, in this respect. And uh, we, we will be there also in the next challenges that the, the society has also in, in, in many ways in developing a digital economy and all the, the important things that, uh, so in that respect, we have somehow a, a common vision and, and mission as the World Bank as well to help others. So thank you, Tammy. I, I, I don't know if, if the, the audio was working okay. I hope it is. Oh, yes, Mercedes, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for the um, perspective of Spain, and we'll dig into, um, into that perspective more in just a minute. But first, um, we'd love to hear the perspective from Brazil. So, Miriam, um, over to you for opening remarks. Thank you so much, Tammy. Firstly, I'd like to say that I'm really delighted to be a part of this panel with such distinguished speakers who bring so much experience to the table. So thank you very much to you and to the team at the World Bank for this kind invitation. 
And speaking from the perspective of a brand new data protection authority created only in November 2020, I'd like to begin with these opening remarks by saying that I truly value the experience and the opportunity of exchanging views and learning from the experience of others. And also I'm delighted to bring some information on what's going on in Brazil and which lessons we've learned over this past year while ANPD has been functioning. So today is, is really a special day for the privacy community and particularly here in my country in Brazil, where we are only now beginning to work on in fact building a data protection culture. And I was remembering that just one year ago on January 28th was the date when ANPD published its regulatory agenda, its two year plan with a list of regulations and norms to be issued over the following years. And since that date, we've had very exciting developments here in the country such as the approval of a constitutional amendment recognizing a fundamental right to data protection alongside the right to privacy that was already explicitly mentioned in our constitution. We've also seen great progress in the implementation of the LGPD in the structuring of our national DPA. And in fact, it's been really interesting to follow this growing community of privacy professionals that have been, has been developing here in Brazil with discussions that I feel are becoming more mature and more aware of the important ben ben uh, benefits and risks posed by the treatment of personal data. So, and all this has happened during a global pandemic, which in its turn has also raised a number of new issues related, for instance, to contact tracing or heat maps and also data sharing between governmental agencies with a view to combating the pandemic. So I think that um, this is, a, in fact, a very exciting and also challenging scenario and I believe that in this increasingly global and digital economy, we do in fact have a huge challenge in creating and maintaining a legal framework that allows data to be treated in a manner that is adequate, that to flow between different countries while also respecting data subjects' rights. So thank you once more, and I really look forward to our discussions. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, we share a lot in common um, because uh, our, privacy program has taken off in, just in the, in the pandemic as well. Our first uh, privacy policy became effective in February of 2021. We, of course, um, enjoy privileges and immunities from national legislation. So our law, in effect, um, uh, became effective in February uh, just one year ago. So we're building and creating the same kind of community that, that you are speaking of. Um, so we, we share that in common. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, let me turn now to a few uh, questions for um, you, Mercedes. We'll, we'll go back to, uh, back to you now that we've set the stage. Um, we're, again, we're so happy to have you here. Um, of course, Spain has a, um, a mature uh, data protection approach, as you said, as being part of the European Union and um, first subject to the privacy directive and the data protection directive and now subject to the GDPR. Um, so I'd love to hear more about your role. First, I want to make sure that Mercedes, you can hear me. I know that you were having difficulty with your audio. Are you able to hear me? Now I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Oh, very good. Very good. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, very good. So um, I would love to hear more about your role in responding to uh, questions and concerns from the citizens in Spain. Is there a common theme or, or um, a, a set of, of issues that you're hearing uh, on a daily basis, or is there a trend that you're hearing? Yes, and uh, Tommy, the, we have uh, we are the frontliners of the agency. I mean, we are in the first row. We respond to the queries of citizens, uh, to the consultations of DPOs, and also of uh, controllers, data controllers, and data processors as well. I mean, uh, they they come to us with the with the their questions and and, and concerns. And uh, we have two ways uh, normally to solve the, those problems. There is a, a, a line for citizens, uh, telephone and, and written questions, and for DPOs. And we have we receive a lot of questions uh, every year, and our we uh, our actions 
are around 700,000 that for a, a country that is uh, 40 million, 47 million is, is quite a lot. So we have a lot of actions of informative actions and promotion of information. And I can tell if I have to select what uh, could be the main concerns of the citizens and they raised to us are basically, for example, related to um, the use of internet and the problems that they have with identity theft, with um, with uh, misuse, with uh, and, and, and lack of knowledge on or how they 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 are um, they are uh, collecting the data. Uh, they they don't know. They are concerned and and there are problems about that. There are many questions also about the 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 processing of data at labor life and the, at labor life and also the problems that uh, that can create of discrimination or um, uh, stigmatization also at labor life. There are a lot of questions also related with the virus video surveillance. So video surveillance is now everywhere and uh, people feel uh, a lot of problems and feel a lot of threats because of video surveillance. There are uh, many questions also related with um, uh, financial uh, problems. I mean, the inclusion in debtors file and, and, and all these, these questions that are uh, daily issues that can affect a lot to the, to the, to the companies. And as regards the data protection officers, well, we can consider differently if they, are, uh, they belong to public sector, to uh, public administrations that they also consult to us so how they the best way they have to handle the the data of the citizens security problems and from the private sector uh, there are numerous um, but basically they are related with the the the, the new uh, regulations the new regulation also how to apply it better but those are basically as in in big lines what are the main concerns of the citizens or are, are preoccupations that are in, in their life, not artificial, real preoccupations, which are related with the protection of the personal information. Very interesting. So the, the high number of um, uh, comments or questions from um, the Spanish uh, citizens indicates that there's a broad awareness of data privacy and data protection issues. So. Yes again, reflecting the, the um, tenure of the, the, the thought that data should be protected in the European Union. Um, one other focus of your office is education and children. And I understand that you have um, recently uh, conducted a campaign to raise awareness of explicit photographs of children on the internet. What has that process been like, and um, has it been effective? Yeah. Well, that's very interesting that you put that question because I think it's it's something that people should know. We uh, uh, the protection of uh, children and youngsters was one of the priorities of the agency, in not only in Spain but in many other countries. There have been very tough situations for for children and, 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 and youngsters that even come, uh, lead them to commit suicide. So it's, we are talking about something very tough and that sometimes the parents and teachers don't know how to react. So for us it was a priority. We have in the agency um, a hotline for, for youngsters and children and um, canal prioritario in Spanish. So that uh, gives priority to taking actions on that. And we also have developed a campaign, a specific campaign in which we count with the, the, the help of the main uh, TV broadcasts that they cooperate in advertising this information for free because of that agreement that we they did with the, the agency that it was, um, you can stop it, something like that. No? I mean, that it, it not uh, transmitting uh, contents and not transmitting uh, uh, forwarding messages via WhatsApp. Via, it's it's something that you can stop this kind of harassment. So we have many many ways for us. It's a priority. The the way to connect uh, with uh, children and with the agency and to transmit problems. 
We have many uh, vias of communication with the agency and very simple. They can com communicate with us via WhatsApp, via email, via uh, e normal email and, and the, the, the electronic. Uh, so we make it very simple that they can raise the concerns to us before doing any nonsense and parents also can contact to us and we have also many um, actions for uh, academics and education. So for us, it's very important. And that campaign, uh, with, uh, we also have a specific, uh, not only because of data protection uh, regulation or our national law on data protection, but also for the law on, um, on uh, service, electronic services, that we can request and, and request uh, the, the media that is transmitting contents that related to uh, kids and uh, um, pornography or whatever sensitive contents, they can, uh, we can request them and ask them to withdraw the contents and then they have to do it. And I have to tell you that uh, always when the agency has acted in this respect, 90% they react immediately and they withdraw this content. So I think that if the data protection authorities uh, take it seriously, they they have a lot of uh, of uh, of tools and, and possibilities to to take these contents out from from the internet and the social media well what an important role you are playing in combating um that mm -hmm. that unfortunate um uh thing that we see so um very very important thank you for that background um uh, great work that you're doing um, Miriam, let's turn back to you. Um, so we've heard about the established um, Spanish approach to data protection. And again, Brazil's um, is in its infancy. I'd love to hear um, first about the approach that, that the Brazil regulation takes. Um, is it similar to the European GDPR or is it different? Um, could you just speak of, for a few minutes on on what the approach is like in Brazil. Of course, Tammy. So I think it's important also to note that in Brazil, our law came into force in different stages. So we first had a, approximately 10 years of discussion within government and in National Congress. It was a period of some political uncertainty as to the approval of the law. And finally, in August 2018, the law was approved. But the only provisions that came into effect immediately were those regarding the creation of the National DPA and of our advisory board. And then 18 months later, with the pandemic already going on, the law came into force with exception of the provisions related to administrative sanctions. And these sanctions finally became enforceable as of August 2021. So it was quite a lengthy process. And the idea was, in fact, to give organizations time to reorganize themselves to comply with the new legislation. And, uh, and an interesting point is that ANPD was formally created, formally structured while the law was already in force. So this also provided for some uncertainty and certainly a huge challenge for us because we were sort of running after the time that had already been lost with the law in force, but without the DPA functioning. Um, and we are currently working on another bill of law in order to strengthen our institutional capacities since there is still some discussion on the issue of autonomy and independence, which of course is hugely important when we think of a body that is responsible for supervising both the public and the private sectors. But that being said, um, the LGPD is very similar to the GDPR. It is in fact a law that adopts an ex ante approach to personal data protection, which means that it is necessary to have a legal basis that allows data to be processed legit legitimately um, there are also a number of principles to be observed and also a number of data subject rights that are quite similar to the those we find in the gdpr the basic arco rights access rectification cancellation opposition and so on so there are minor differences i could mention for instance that we have more legal basis for data processing than the gdpr gdpr has six we have ten they are mostly similar to the GDPR, with with exception of one very particular legal base, which is that of protection of credit, which I think under the European approach would usually be treated as legitimate interest. So here we have a specific legal basis for that. Um, our access rights are quite similar, but we have different deadlines for complying with data access requests. Um, there are differences also with regard to data breaches because here it is necessary in all cases to notify not only the DPA, but also the data subject. 
And finally, with regard to international data transfers, although our approach is in general quite similar, there are also nuances. In particular, here in Brazil, we cannot rely on legitimate interest to transfer data internationally. But I would say that in general, our laws adopt a very similar approach and that perhaps it's more interesting for us to focus on the similarities and not on the differences in this case. Very interesting. And as you were describing um, the principles-based approach and the legitimate inter or the legitimate purpose or bases for transferring, um, much of that is reflected in the World Bank Group's policy as well um, at a different level, but uh, very common, uh, common themes that we've adopted as well. Um, so now that we've heard from each of um, the different perspectives, I'd love to talk about the memorandum of understanding that I that was recently formed between Spain and Brazil. Um, I think that's so encouraging to see that international cooperation um, and the, the fact that it um, applies to data protection is even more um, important. Um, I'd love to hear how that came about and what it means and um, what how the process has has gone. Um, Mercedes, do you want to start off? Oh, you're muted. Okay. The, in, uh, the, the Spanish Data Protection Agency uh, is uh, holds or created uh, some years ago uh, the so called uh, um, um, Ibero American. Uh, Ibero-American uh, Data Protection Network, uh, Red uh, Ibero-Americana de Protección de Datos, in which uh, they were gathered uh, in, by that time, so it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago, very few countries with data protection law. Now they, for, they were going uh, joining more and more. And uh, currently, I think that we have uh, a, 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 an important uh, group of, of uh, countries with their own authority, as for example, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Costa Rica, uh, Mexico, Panama, Peru, Paraguay, Portugal, and uh, Uruguay. No, they, are, they are joining as observers, for example, other organizations as OEA, the Federal Trade Commission of the United States, Eurosocial, and now currently they are joining uh, citizens uh, organizations or NGOs. So in that context of uh, mutual cooperation in which we exchange uh, in ideas and, and um, we put in common uh, legislation and also we have tried always to foster and to back up uh, some countries and authorities in developing uh, data protection laws. Uh, in, in that context, it has been when Brazil, I think that it, it's a very young uh, uh, authority and, 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 and very young law, uh, they, they were interested in, uh, in, in, in promote the training. Uh, well, we, we were interested also in helping them to uh, train uh, high profile te technicians in, in their authority. I mean, data protection is now uh, very much, is going to require a lot of uh, very expert people in IT things. No? And the, the agency, we have been traditionally very well equipped on that. We have uh, telecommunications engineers, um, uh, informatics, a lot of people, because really the, the core issue of data protection is on the net and, and in, 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 in the cloud and in, in this, Tool. So I think we decided the Brazil authority, I think that Miriam was also involved on that, uh, to cooperate in this uh, memorandum of understanding that is in the field specifically of uh, training and mutual help in, in, in technical matters. I think that is the best way we can cooperate from our experience. Oh, that's very inspiring. Um, nice to hear. Miriam, what's your um, experience, Ben, and, and what are your hopes for this, uh, this partnership? Um, I think it's important to mention that we have been seeking to actively engage with other DPAs and international organizations, because of course, as, as Mercedes mentioned, we are brand new, we still have so much to do, and I think that if we can learn from the experience and mistakes and successes of other authorities, we will gain lots of time, we'll be able to leapfrog perhaps 
some of the, the difficulties that other authorities faced in their early stages. So our cooperation with the Spanish agency was, uh, it actually began in a very bottom up manner because some staff members were trying to understand issues related to security incidents and data breaches. And they reached out to colleagues and other DPAs and this began a conversation which ended up in this memorandum of understanding. And, and I do think that, you know, while our legislation is not identical to the GDPR, there are in fact many commonalities and I think there should be an active effort from our part in, in terms of seeking to adopt harmonized approaches as much as possible, make our legislation as interoperable as possible, because this is important not only for economic purposes, but also for data subject protection, right? So um, besides our cooperation with AAPD, we also have a good relationship with other DPAs, with the European Commission, with the FTC, for instance. And we have also joined a number of international organizations where data protection is discussed. For instance, we have been following the work at OECD. We've joined the Global Privacy Assembly as an observer. We've also joined the Global Privacy Enforcement Network, the Ibero-America Network of Data Protection, which was mentioned by Nick Sages. And we are also observers of Convention 108. And I think this reflects our desire to really come to the state of the art of data protection and, and learn from you know, those that have come before us and have already trailed this path that we are only now beginning to follow. Oh, wonderful. Um, how, how nice to be able to learn from others who have uh, forged the path like Mercedes and, and her, um, her office. I also think it's really important that um, it, this type of relationship reflects the fact that data subjects don't stay within a political boundary. Data subjects are, are traveling all the time, and if there are different rights and different approaches, that's really difficult and um, uh, concerning. You also have uh, uh, data flows where um, you might do business in one country and be in a different country. So this, this type of um, cooperation is really, really encouraging to, uh, to hear. So kudos to, to your two offices for, for doing this. Um, we have to, I'd like to turn now to the, um, the topic that we've touched on, which is the pandemic. Um, Miriam, you've mentioned that your, uh, your office has grown or uh, come of age during the pandemic, as has ours. Um, and Mercedes, you certainly must have seen changes. I'd love to first hear, um, Mercedes, if you've uh, heard different concerns from, from individuals or if you if you sense a different relationship um, to personal data and data protection from individuals during the pandemic? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay, so it, 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 uh, certainly it, it, we have received a lot of concerns about that. We have to bear in mind that the, the, the pandemic and the, the declaration of the pandemic uh, in, in March, I think it was in March, in, or by the end of February 2020, took everyone by surprise. I mean, that people had to uh, incorporate to their day-to-day -day lives and uh, the teleworking, start using uh, internet, start using internet kits of um, age seven, so everything came without any training, any preparation of the threats of uh, internet, of the, the potential misuse of information. Everybody suddenly came home. Everything went very, very, very rushed and start with their life with the IT tools and, and using tools that they never and then they were not prepared to 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 use no? that respect, even the, the, the employers uh, were not even, they had to do a great effort in providing tools to their workers and everything on safety basis. People were working from home um, handling very sensitive information without a VPN, for example, any uh, secure line of, of communication. So there were a lot of, um, problems that uh, occur in that field that were uh, made suddenly people put themselves in a very vulnerable situation, the information that they handled also in a very uh, vulnerable situation without time for reacting. Then the things after the months, they, they started becoming more 
more and more um, aware of the risks. Companies start uh, improving and, and implementing security measures. But uh, of course, there are many, uh, many problems with, the, with the, the massive use of pandemia as the only way uh, of, uh, of, uh, of relating to each other and continue working and continue with economical business and everything was the use of a technology that they were they 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 didn't know how to work in a in a proper manner in a safety way so we we received a lot of questions of course we 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 did we have to help also uh, actors to to try to 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 implement the the security in in the, the daily lives and in the in the use basically of computers or in the in internet in a, in a specific manner and also at the, in the labor life we had a lot of questions about the, the how to implement uh, these security measures what are the consequences if my employer um, um, do i have to do to give this information to my employer, to whom, for example, all the information according to the uh, European regulation, all the health information is a sensitive information. And suddenly everybody had to inform uh, their employers, their colleagues, uh, everyone about something that was really sensitive. If one was sick, it was one was vaccinated and everything. And, and in that respect, I think, that we also provide good hints, uh, and we start working very, very rapidly with the, the uh, health authorities at the national level, and also in the, in the committee, European Committee for Data Protection, on how to handle that and how to make possible to continue life, and and, and also respecting as as much as possible the, the data protection principles and rights of the citizens, which it has to be always combined with the normal life and, and with economical life. So in, the, in that respect, we had to collaborate a lot with the health authorities and to try to, to, to find, to strike the right balance between privacy and this situation that was so exceptional that um, put uh, all of us upside down and we have to, to, to continue with that. Mm. Uh, yes, that, that finding that balance in such an unusual circumstance where, as you said, never would we have dreamt we'd be sharing our health information with our employer or the um, shop down the street um, here in the US. You know, sometimes they take your temperature before you walk in, that those, those concepts were just inconceivable before the pandemic. And now we have to find that balance between our personal um, information and the, the benefit of the good, the public good. Um, Miriam, what's your, what is your experience then um, with not much to compare to, but um, have you sensed a shift in individuals' um, willingness or um, unwillingness to share this type of data? Indeed, Tammy, and I think Mercedes touched upon a number of very important issues. And, and I think the main points that Mercedes was making is that suddenly, instantly, our, all our social and economic relationships shifted to the digital environment with little or no preparation. So I, I can say from my own point of view, creating ANPD in the middle of a pandemic was certainly hugely challenging. You know, building a team from scratch where people were not physically present is, of course, very difficult. And I think also from the data protection perspective, this raised a number of concerns related to information security, of course, because people were suddenly migrating to insecure networks, insecure devices, working from home, sharing their working space with dogs and cats and other human beings where information was, you know, just not protected the way it should be. Um, and I think also uh, from the point of view of children and teens, this was very challenging. Mercedes was also stating this. I can mention that I have a son who was six years old at the time. He's now eight years old. And suddenly all these kids are using the online environment with you know, not always enough adult supervision. And they suddenly have access to this whole universe of games and online apps. And, and, and this was, I think, a huge challenge for many families as well. Um, during the pandemic here in Brazil, I'd say that a number of new issues were raised related not only to information security, but I think most of all related to data sharing, because I think a universal result of the pandemic was the increase of the demands for data sharing, not only between 
governmental bodies, but also between healthcare organizations and startups and tech companies. And this in Brazil, in fact, raised a number of constitutional challenges. So one of our most important cases here was related to uh, an attempt to share data between telephone companies and our national statistics office. And this, in fact, ended up bringing about a Supreme Court decision in Brazil that recognized a number of elements that are hugely important for us, such as the idea of informational self-determination, a fundamental right to data protection, which was later formally recognized in our own constitution. So, so the feeling I have that is that because of this pandemic and because of these new demands for data sharing, you mentioned the issue of uh, health data, which is sensitive data, as Mercedes was mentioning. Uh, we had a discussion here in Brazil, for instance, on publicizing the list of people who were receiving vaccines in the very early day when they were still very scarce. So I think all of this has raised a certain level of awareness that we did not previously have here in Brazil. People somehow are becoming more conscious of the digital footprints they leave behind them. And they are also beginning to question some demands for data sharing, which perhaps they would not have questioned previously because in fact, we did not have a law. We did not have a data protection authority responsible for enforcing these rules. So I do think there has been an important shift as a result of the pandemic. And the question perhaps is how this will evolve, you know, as we move forward and as the pandemic becomes more under control. Very interesting. Um, let's let's continue on that um, vein. I'd love to turn to um, trends or what you what you think will be come out of this if we are in an endemic, um, not a pandemic, but if this is uh, how we are operating now, how we're living and and um, uh, interacting with the world. Um, Miriam, what do you what do you see? Um, in the future, if you if you had a crystal ball, what would you what would you predict for this, let's say, uh, year or two? Um, I can give you a guess, perhaps, on what will happen in Brazil. And I think that perhaps an important consequence is that organizations are also more aware of the responsibilities they have when treating data. And, and this is something I can speak of also on a personal level, because uh, when the pandemic began here in Brazil, our law was about to enter into force. We didn't have a DPA. <sighs> And suddenly there was huge uncertainty also within government on what are we in fact allowed to do with data? Is it admissible to share data? What sort of protection should I have? And suddenly this became an important question here in Brazil, also because of the lawsuits I mentioned. And now that the law is enforced and that ANPB is in fact working on enforcing the law and able to apply administrative fines and sanctions, I have a feeling that also this issue becomes more important within organizations. Here in Brazil, for instance, we have not only ANPD, but also other public bodies that have been very active in trying to enforce privacy rules. For instance, public prosecutors, the judiciary branch, consumer protection organizations, and um, I think that as we seek here in Brazil to promote this new data protection culture uh, through a more responsive approach, we have also been seeing very interesting initiatives coming from the private sector in terms of adopting self-regulatory approaches or co-regulatory approaches with private codes of conduct, for instance, which I think are an important first step in this idea of raising awareness and creating greater accountability when it comes to data protection. So I do think we are still in the early days and somehow the pandemic has you know, pushed us forward to move, move more quickly perhaps than would have happened in other circumstances. And I do believe that we will continue evolving and, and cre creating a more mature legal framework in order for data to be treated and, and to be shared responsibly here in Brazil. Interesting, thank you for that. Um, Mercedes, if you had a crystal ball, uh, what would you, what do you predict for the next year or two in Spain or just data protection generally? Mercedes, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. Are you muted? Okay, we'll come back to Mercedes. Um, uh, hopefully she can fix the audio. Um, so Miriam, I'll, I'll stay with you for now. Um, there, I'm gonna turn to audience questions. We have quite a number of them and very interesting questions. Um, a couple of them um, are really appropriate for you as you're building your new office. Um, 
uh, I'm going to combine two questions. What are the advantages and disadvantages of building from scratch um, rather than coming in and and perhaps uh, uh, a more mature um, audio or office? And then what? How do you prioritize your your focus? You, I'm sure you have limited resources and you have to decide, you know, what you're going to triage and approach first. Um, in fact, Tammy, we do have very limited resources. When ANPD was created, we didn't inherit any previously existing structure within public administration. So in November 2020, we had only five staff members, which were the five directors. And now we have approximately 50, which I think is good, but still not great when you consider we have 230 million inhabitants here in Brazil. So this is certainly something we have to take into consideration when we try to create strategies for promoting data protection culture here in Brazil. So I think one of the advantages is that we can, in fact, learn from the discussions that have been held elsewhere. And I think in this sense, something we have learned from other authorities is that we have to be selective in order to be effective. You know, it's not possible to attack all the issues simultaneously. We have to have a good look at the forest, not at the trees individually. So what we did do in our very early days was come up with a regulatory agenda, clearly stating 10 priorities to be dealt with over the first two years. And these include, of course, uh, important regulations such as monitoring and sanctions, uh, the role of the DPO, international data transfers, among other issues, and also uh, I'm sorry, something popped up here. Um, and also, I think when we when we discuss enforcement actions, it is also very important to act based on evidences. So in our regulation on sanctions, we have included one necessary step, which is monitoring, monitoring the market and also monitoring data subject complaints in order to allow us to identify which issues are in fact the most important, which issues create the most impact for data subjects, and these will then be placed on a priority list to be addressed in the first place. So um, I think just to conclude, another point we have been working on very hard is to, to seek more uh, intergovernmental cooperation. And this is important in Brazil because not only because we are a very small organization, we need to increase our, increase our, our spread and our capacity to act in an effective manner, but also because we have a quite complex legal framework here in Brazil where we have, have a number of other public bodies that have some responsibilities that may, in a certain manner, touch upon the issue of data protection. So we have sought data uh, cooperation agreements, for instance, with our National Consumer Secretariat, with our National Antitrust Body, with the Internet Steering Committee, also with our Supreme Court for elections, our, our electoral courts, because we have nationwide elections coming up this year. And in this sense, what we are trying to do is first of all to have good cooperation arrangements in terms of enforcement but also i think above all to create more uh, uniform understandings of the law more clear interpretations that can be followed in a consistent manner throughout the country and i think this is perhaps our, our main challenge we have 5560 something municipalities and i think the, the the most important thing is to avoid the fragmentation of interpretations of our national law uh, very interesting um, thank you for that. And thank you, Christine and Rahul, for those questions. Um, very appropriate for Miriam. Um, Mercedes, welcome back. I'm glad you glad you were able to rejoin. Um, I have a question for you from Rachel. Um, very uh, interesting, uh, perhaps philosophical question. Um, Rachel asks, should the role of protecting personal data fall on government or the citizens? What's your perspective on that? Well, uh, if you mean the the well the, the government in in terms of I mean that the the, the, the protection of uh, of uh, data I think that they has to 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 be held in an independent authority that I think and public authority I think that this is the most important thing that there is a public authority which can act in totally independent from the government because uh, the the term a governmental uh, authority in the states mean public and, and for us governmental is that they, it depends on the government so we don't use the, this term but to me the the role of supervision is quite crucial and i think that should be held by a body that is public and and and, and is it, it acts totally independent i think it, it, it that's my view this is 
the most effective uh, manner in protecting that fundamental right. Because from the perspective of the European Union, the, 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 the right to, uh, to protect your personal data is a fundamental right. I mean, it's not uh, something that is... So then the, the, the citizens might have a protection of that fundamental right. It's in, 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 our, um, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and it's also in most of the constitu constitutions of the member states of the European Union. So it has to be protected act actively by the, the, the public bodies. Mm, thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Anima that um, is near and dear to our hearts here at the bank, and that's the balance between transparency and the protection of data. And uh, how you can achieve the, the appropriate level of transparency while still protecting personal data. Um, would either of you like to comment on that? Miriam? Sure, I can say a few words, Tammy, because in fact, this has been a, a very important discussion here in Brazil. Um, in Brazil, we have a, a freedom of information law, a transparency law since 2011. And speaking as a professional civil servant, I can say that in fact, this law has created a huge cultural change within government because now we, we realize that the rule is for information to be publicly available and not you know, secretly protected. But when the general data protection law was approved and came into force, a certain tension began to arise between these two legislations. And of course, personal data protection laws are not anti-transparency laws, but new considerations are placed on the table when you realize that government also holds a huge amount of personal data and that perhaps a new balance needs to be found between transparency and protection. So uh, what we have been discussing here in Brazil is that in fact, both publicity, transparency, but also privacy and personal data protection are protected by our constitution. So these are two constitutional values that are important for democratic society. And that in fact, one law does not um, kill the other law. They both have to coexist in a harmonized manner. So I think the challenge we are facing currently is to try and, and understand which tools LGPD can bring to us to allow us to decide when and how information should be made public and under which circumstances it should not. So we can discuss, for instance, data protection impact assessments. We can discuss the principle of data minimization, for instance, uh, purpose limitation. All these principles, I think, may assist us to interpret, the, interpret these two laws in a harmonized manner in order to allow data to be public that needs to be made public in order to allow social control and you know, transparency. But on the other hand, not expose excessively uh, citizens' data that is held by the government because of this very special relationship between citizens and government. So this is certainly uh, an important legal discussion here in Brazil. Um, I could also mention that there has already been a, a discussion of this before a Supreme Court a few years ago, uh, determining, for instance, that the salaries of civil servants have to be made public. So we have sort of the same tensions, you know, between access to information and privacy. And in this case, the Supreme Court has already stated that this information should be made public in order to allow adequate social control. So we have some important parameters to work on here in Brazil, but certainly it's not an easy discussion. Indeed. I would say, if, if I may add something to what Miriam said, in the European Union, there is all, uh, already a, a long tradition of case law of the European Court of Justice on how to solve the tension that uh, could, could occur. And as always, the, 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 the European Court of Justice, it comes to a very wise conclusion that serve for whatever, no? because any fundamental rights in the European Union had to be interpreted according to the proportionality principle. I mean, that the, the measure that is requested is needed that is adequate to the goal that is, is, uh, is aimed to, and that it doesn't uh, provide an excessive um, over, uh, overburden on the, the, the citizen. So according to these three elements that are the proportionality principle, you can solve most of the cases. I mean, there is, to me, there is no contradiction between the data protection and transparency. Yes, to, it had to be, studied in each case on, on its own uh, grounds on, on, and then come to the conclusions according to the proportionality principle. 
And we have it because the, the unit I, 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 I lead deals also with the access to, to public documents, I mean, to transparency. And sometimes they request the names and personal data of uh, officials of, uh, of uh, certain persons or uh, company holders or whatever. And uh, we make that, uh, we strike the right balance and then come with the proportionality principle to the, the, the right conclusion in most of the cases. I think that they lead pretty well together. It's a matter of interpreting according to this principle. Excellent, excellent. I'm I'm taking notes for how to how to balance this with, within the bank because we we also have an access to information policy and uh, we are working on harmonizing the two so that we don't throw out the the transparency, um, but we um, we find find the right balance. Um, we have many more questions from the audience. Thank you everybody for. Uh, for these. I wish we could get to all of them, but um, we are coming to the end of our hour. Um, so I would like to now turn to Boyana um, for closing remarks. Um, Boyana, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tommy, and thank you again to World Bank for your leadership again in putting this phenomenal uh, celebration of data privacy, because I think we'd have a lot to celebrate. It was delightful to hear the three data protection authorities and it maybe my first comment would be to actually see how the role of data protection authority has changed over the years right how bigger uh, more important more critical it is going to be for this new digital society that we live in to me really dpa is becoming the key data digital regulator in this new world because they're not regulating just data privacy and human right to data protection, but they're regulating use, sharing, access, flows of data. And data is the most important um, fuel of our economy. And in fact, it's a little bit like environmental protection for me, right? We need to ensure we have got responsible use of data and sustainable use data in our system so we can all benefit uh, economically as countries, as companies, as public sector as well. So, um, no pressure, but huge uh, change of role of data protection authority and that requires, um, you know, for them to think with this dual hat. One hat is data protection and privacy, but this other hat is data enablement and responsible use of data. And for that, they need new skills, they need new resources, and they critically need international cooperation. It's not good enough to just stay within your own country. Uh, Tammy, you have said it, and I think our uh, DPAs have said it as well, data, technology, and people are global. And we have to co collaborate and cooperate across borders and, and as much as possible have unified uh, guidance and interpretation of the rules. Even if the rules can't be always the same, the interpretation, the spirit can perhaps be more aligned. So I'm really delighted um, to see work by the Global Privacy Assembly, by Ibero-America Network, the Global Privacy Enforcement Network, and also engagement with, with industry as well, the DPAs do. Um, so that's first comment. And I think all three of you have done an amazing job. I have to give some credit. Mercedes, you remember we started, it was a Spanish DPA years ago that started a discussion on uh, Madrid Declaration and how can we converge around the same principles. Um, Commissioner Blanca, we, we, you know, um, uh, Mexico was one of the first countries that recognized accountability in its law and its system. And, and Miriam, you, you are such a young data protection authority, but incredibly wise and incredibly impactful. And it's been amazing to see that, that the actual, how you've taken the best of the world, what world gave you and actually um, leveraged that already. So, so you all on a good track. Um, my second comment is, um, I would really like DPAs to encourage, incentivize and reward accountability and good behaviors. I think the role of DPA is to drive those good behaviors as well as to punish those who deliberately uh, and, and negligently break the rules. So um, how can you incentivize and reward and showcase what good looks like will be really important for the companies who, as you have all said, are looking for charters, they're looking for the compass in these new uncharted territories in uncharted waters. Um, 
we as CIPL have actually published a paper at the end of last year uh, based on survey with global DPAs on how they take into account accountability and, and companies having privacy management program in their enforcement supervision uh, action. And we found some different approaches um, certainly uh, across the globe, but there is a trend that more and more are starting to do that. So we would love to see more of that. And then my final words, I know I've got 30 seconds probably, <clears throat> are uh, <clears throat> a really call to action to say that um, just like uh, Tammy, you've talked how, you know, you as a public uh, uh, sector, international organization, you know, many global companies in private sector have to find new way to deal with this data protection, you know, this disruption. Um, I think the regulators have to also look a new way to regulate and supervise. So we are very uh, supportive of <clears throat> innovative tools such as regulatory sandbox that regulators can uh, use to ensure and deliver responsible innovation where companies or public sector would bring important uh, projects I mean, COVID would have been a great example where kind of this happened informally, but we'd like to formalize this a little bit more. So where companies get that and public sector get that feedback from regulators, they work together in the areas of gray where both uh, are learning from each other and it gives much more trust uh, that the product will be privacy compliant, but will also enable this kind of public interest use of data. Policy prototyping is another interesting tool. And then finally, <clears throat> constructive engagement with industry, with technologists, with experts around the world. <clears throat> this is going to be absolutely critical as we all together work in this new digital world. So those are my concluding comments, but really pleasure to hear everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Boyana. And um, I, I also want to recognize the very important work that CIPL, the Center for Information Policy, that you lead, uh, the role that your organization plays in this. So um, thank you so much, um, everyone, Boyana, Miriam, uh, Blanca, and Mercedes. Um, I, I'm, I have to comment, it's wonderful to be on a panel with all women, and uh, it, this, is, this is really special. Thank you to the audience for your engagement and for listening. Please, everybody, um, I, I would encourage you to look at the agenda for the rest of the day. It's a fabulous, fabulous lineup. And this was just the, um, the icebreaker. So thank you, everybody. Um, and I look forward to speaking with all of you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.